Um, a couple of things about that exam. Remember that it is cumulative. Hello. Um, so you'll see some review from the first exam. So chapters 18, 19, 20, all the stuff on evolutionary theory and foundations and phylogenies and um, population genetics. You'll see about 20% probably, so 20 or 20. 20 to 25 percent of the exam so 20 or 25 questions somewhere in that range um that is that is review okay so very small portion of the exam there are plenty of new questions to ask you because we're doing 21 22 23 24 25 and 26 hypothetically on this exam so all of your diversity chapters through plants okay um so that's a lot Plenty of things to ask you guys. So you can expect 100 questions, no problem coming up with that for that many chapters. And about 20 of them, 20 to 25, like I said, will be reviewed from the first exam. Same questions. Okay, so it won't be new questions that you've never seen before. It will be questions that you saw on the first exam, just repeated. Um, I had a good question about the Hardy Weinberg stuff, the calculations. You don't have to do that again. Okay. Um, you might see questions about Hardy Weinberg equilibrium, but you don't need a calculator, you don't have to do that. So that's done for now. So you take a population genetics course or an evolutionary biology course or something like that later. Okay. Um, the other thing, oh, I made you guys a Kahoot review for the midterm. It's in the same spot where you guys had your first exam one review. And it's just exactly the same thing, a collection of questions, similar to those we've done in class, similar to those that you might see on the exam. Of course, remember, these are the easiest questions because they are the Kahoot questions. Right, so the short and to the point, usually vocabulary based um, or otherwise. But a lot of your questions this time will be that type of question, right? Because there's a lot of just knowing species, knowing groups, being able to classify things, recognize characteristics, stuff like that. Okay, so that's a good place to practice. Um, the Kahoot is available until 11 um, on Thursday night. So it closes like an hour before the exam itself closes. And that's about it. So what we get through today will be where we stop for the exam. So we'll, we'll see how we do. Um, and then I'm gonna do my best to get this lecture posted to B2L by tonight, as long as I can get the videos to process and nothing weird happens with YouTube or whatever, sometimes happens, but that's the plan, okay? You guys good? All right, let's do it. Back to plants. Um, yes. We were talking about Scroll through. I think I was looking to see what else I could cut out of here. We were talking about um, adaptations to life on land. So just to quickly review, um, we're talking about streptophytes being the uh, carophyte green algae and the land plants. That's the group that includes, um, the streptophytes include the green algae that land plants evolved from. So we talked a bit about that. Um, and then we started talking about the adaptations that we see in plants that have appeared over the millions of years since those algae first sort of creeped up onto the land just outside the freshwater habitats, right? Um, so we looked at drought tolerance and resistance to desiccation. What was desiccation? Yeah, drying out. Yeah, so if you're going to move from the water to the land, that's your first concern. How do I not dry out, right? So we talked about some things that plants can do to regulate their water content, um, water loss, and things like that. Then we talked about structural support. Why is it important to have increased or reinforced structural strength when you move on to land as opposed to water? Yeah, gravity is a bigger deal when you live on the land. Yes, you're more buoyant in the water. Water lifts, uh, provides some lift to, to molecules in general. And we talked about apical meristem, um, which is that continued area of mycotic tissue in the tips, in the shoots and in the roots, which allows for further growth down. Right, which in turn allows for the growth up. Yes, so we're talking about um, being on land, being able to get taller, moving towards that source of energy, which is what the sun, yeah, and um, competing. So when you start to have neighbors that are also moving out onto land, if they can get taller than you and shade you out, there's a new kind of competition in town, so to speak. Okay, so we covered those two. Uh, we talked about vascular structures. We'll talk about vascular versus non-vascular plants in just a few minutes and uh, talk more about that. So we've got three more adaptations to life on land to talk about before we discover why it happened. What was the pressure? What was the selective pressure to move on to land in the first place? Um, so as you're leaving the water, you have to consider that you need protection from UVB radiation. 
when you are talking about radiation from the sun, uh, you've got some of those rays in the UV spectrum that are damaging to DNA, right? That's why we put on sunscreen when we go out in the summertime to protect our cell DNA from damage from the sun. Um, plants do this by synthesizing pigments that can absorb UV wavelengths of light. So they make their own sunscreen, which is kind of cool, right? So you've got pigments that are used for photosynthesis, yes? What is an example of a photosynthetic pigment in a plant? Chlorophyll, yeah. What color is chlorophyll? Green, some, some tinge of green, right? Um, so we're talking about these other types of pigments, things like carotenoids. Carotenoids tend to be more in the yellow range, um, so they absorb different wavelengths, but instead of using that wavelength that, or that um, sunlight energy to power photosynthesis, they just absorb it and dissipate it as heat. So essentially they're there to protect the plant from UV damage uh, from that radiation. So that's a new adaptation that we see in plants um, as we move on to land. Eventually you need protection from predation. Now when we talk about plants and we talk about predation, what are we really talking about? Is it a predator-prey interaction in the typical sense of like something hunting something down and eating it? Not really. So who are the predators of plants? What would you call those types of organisms? Not carnivores, but herbivores. herbivores. Yeah, so things that eat plants. We don't generally talk about them being predators, but they kind of are. Right. So predators of plants would be our herbivores, our grazers, things like that. Um, but, the, but why do I say eventually, do you think? Who moved on the land first? Plants, yeah. So around the same time, there's probably some early arthropods, some early insects and things on land. So there's not a ton of, uh, there are zero vertebrates, right, on land at this point in time. They're all still in the water. Um, so very few herbivores around to eat things. So in the beginning, in the early stages of plants making the move onto land, they don't really need to have this, uh, this protective mechanism in place for um, herbivory, but later that becomes an issue as things start to evolve. So we see things like secondary metabolites, um, for example, toxic alkaloid compounds. And we've talked about toxic alkaloids in another group that you don't want to eat, which is what? Yeah. Mushroom fungi, yeah. So, um, there are quite a few alkaloids in plants that we ingest or that we use for medicine. So we uh, make great, uh, we, it's very practical for us. We make great use of these compounds, but plants are making them to protect themselves from organisms that want to chew on their leaves or chew on their flowers. Um, an example of this is digitoxin. It's made by the foxglove plant here. We use it to make heart medication. That's just one small example. Um, some other examples would be things like um, caffeine, right? Who had coffee this morning? Yeah, so we take advantage of that, right? But caffeine is actually a, a secondary metabolite. The reason we call it secondary is because it's not something that the plant must have to survive. So the plant makes things like sugar, yes, through photosynthesis. That would be a primary photosynthate. Yes, a, a, a really important primary metabolite, so to speak, a product of metabolism that the plant must have to survive. It's feeding itself. But it doesn't need caffeine. It doesn't need nicotine. It doesn't need um, opioid compounds, right? All of those are secondary metabolites, meaning those are compounds that the plant is assembling for itself, but it doesn't need them to survive. It doesn't need it for its life cycle, but it's using it to protect itself against herbivora. So if you are a small insect and you start chewing on a uh, coffee plant and you get into that caffeine, those effects on your nervous system are going to deter you from doing that anymore. Does that make sense? Um, sometimes those alkaloids will kill the herbivore. And that's a good lesson too, wouldn't, wouldn't you say? Um, so we see that, right? So we'll talk more about that later. I think we're probably going to have to skip some of the more detailed stuff about those just because we're going to run out of time. But um, just know that it exists. And then we'll spend a little bit more time focusing on this reproduction piece because we're, we're going to talk about seeds and flowers, which are the most important reproductive strategies for plant, land plants in general. So we'll spend more time talking about this um, in the next chapter. We start talking about angiosperm. But when you move out of the water, you have to figure out a way to disperse your gametes. What does that mean? What are gametes? 
Excellent. Yeah, sex cells. Storm and egg cells, plants have them too. What's dispersal? What does it mean to disperse? Disperse. Yeah, to spread. Right, so you're going to get your gametes from one place to another. So fertilization can happen. Um, in the water, that's pretty easy, right? You can just release gametes into the water and they float or they swim and they find each other and there you go. So that's how most algae do things. Um, but when you get up onto land, you can't just disperse your gametes because they'll fall to the ground or they'll dry out, right? So you got to think about ways to get your gametes around, protect them from desiccation and move them from one place to another. And also protection of zygotes. What's the zygote? Same as, in, as it is in an animal. You guys know zygote. It's that first diploid cell, right? That first cell that forms after fertilization. Once gamete eats gamete, you get zygote, yes? You guys all with me? Okay. Um, so you gotta protect those zygotes from drying out too, outside of the water. Again, in the water, it's no big deal, right? You've got plenty of moisture, but when you're on land, um, you've got to have mechanisms to protect those zygotes and those gametes from drying out um, and being able to move from one place to another. We're going to talk really briefly about alternation of generations. This is just a life strategy, life cycle strategy that plants use. That's a good adaptation to life on land. And then we're going to talk about how they do it. Spores, pollen, flowers, fruits, and seeds. Okay. So together, these three adaptations, uh, adaptations to for structural support and growth, Adaptations to keep from drying out, that's a lot of challenges to overcome, right? That's a lot of evolution to occur to get to the point where we are now, right? Think of pine trees, think of cactus, right? So a lot of changes have occurred. What is the selective pressure to make that happen? Because remember, we're talking about evolution, right? We're talking about adaptation. So meaning there's a population of green algae 500 million years ago that has the ability to do some of these things at least a little bit, right? Those algae that are living on the edge of those freshwater habitats, able to sustain uh, and survive fluctuations in water levels, fluctuations in light, right? So all these things when we think about, um, for example, UV radiation. If you are out of the water for some of the time, you're probably already starting to be a little bit more tolerant to UV radiation or you don't survive, right? So you've got selection pushing these adaptations to occur. That's how evolution works. But what is that selective pressure? What is advantageous about moving out onto land? Why did these organisms thrive and continue to move forward in their evolutionary pathways? Well, first of all, you've got a whole new ecological niche to fill. What is a niche? Do you guys know that word? Like if you have found your niche in life, what have you found? You guys are really, I can hear you, but you're like, what are you talking about? Like, what are you talking about? Something you're really good at, where you fit, right? Where you belong. So your ecological niche um, is the set of circumstances that you need to live. Your ecological niche will include things like where you habitate, where you live, uh, who you live with, who you cooperate with, who you compete with, what do you eat, right? All of these things make up your ecological niche. It's where you sit. It's a specific set of environmental circumstances. On land, it's like a free-for-all because there are no plants out here yet. They're all in the water, right? So land plants don't exist. They're just algae, photosynthetic eukaryotes living in the water, right? Photosynthesizing there. So you've got a whole lot of uh, empty possibilities, right? empty niches to fill. So lots of room to adapt. And we talked about this part, who that would have been, that first uh, colonial algal ancestor moving out onto, onto land. Um, another advantage to moving out onto land is abundant sunlight. We talked about this, right? As you, sort, as you get out onto land, you need to be able to grow taller to get to that sunlight. But there's competition in the water too. So if you are um, looking at the photic zone in a body of water, you're measuring how deep the sunlight penetrates, right? You guys all understand how that works? So light's gonna hit the water and the water itself is gonna filter out some of that sunlight. What else is in that water column besides water molecules? Hmm? There's nutrients. Um, are there organisms? Absolutely. So algae don't just live on the edge, 
right? They also live down throughout the water and they're going to be cyanobacteria. There are going to be lots of other photosynthetic organisms in the water column. So there's competition for light, whether you live in the water or on land. But when you get out onto, onto land, the water, you take the water out of the equation and the sunlight is much more direct. So yes, you have to evolve a way to protect yourself from that UVB radiation, which becomes more intense as you move out on land, but you're also getting more direct sunlight. Does that make sense? So what is the benefit to having more direct sunlight? What is sunlight providing for the organism? Yeah, energy to make more food. So if you can make more food, do you think that you can grow bigger? Are you more powerful? <laughs> Right? Resource acquisition, food acquisition is one of the biggest drivers of natural selection, right? Being able to get enough food. So if you're making your own food and your energy to do it is sunlight, then being exposed to more abundant sunlight is certainly going to be uh, a selective pressure. So if you have the ability to withstand that direct radiation, you can make use of it. Make sense? Our selection is just nudging, nudging those traits in that direction. Um, additionally, CO2 is more concentrated in the air than in the water. So there's carbon dioxide in the water, absolutely. Right? There are photosynthetic organisms that live in the water, that's where they all start. So you can get CO2 out of the water, but in the air it's more concentrated. There's more available. Why is that helpful? Same story as sunlight, different piece of the puzzle. What is carbon dioxide being used for? Photosynthesis, right? That carbon becomes the carbon backbone of the sugar molecules that the plants are using to do photosynthesis. So it's substrate. You guys comfortable with that term? Substrate for photosynthesis is like the pieces that you put together to make something, yes? The building blocks. So you've got more abundant sunlight, more concentrated substrate for photosynthesis, and no predators, right? No herbivores. We just talked about that, at least until you get more vertebrates uh, start to transition to land. Plants are out here all alone, free to fill these ecological niches, lots of sun, low competition, plenty of carbon dioxide, so plenty of selective pressure, right, to be able to, to, to make use of these um, environmental circumstances. Make sense? Seems like a pretty good gig if you're an algae that can do this. Start moving up on the land a little bit. Um, and gradually, remember all of this is happening gradually over millions of years, acquiring these things, right? So it wasn't like an algae just rolled out on the land and grew a cuticle or started making roots, right? It takes time, but these adaptations uh, accumulate till we get to the point where we have the diversity that we see now. Okay, um, this is gonna be hard for me to go quickly because I usually spend a lot of time talking about alternation of generation. Um, I'm going to do my best to give you the quick and dirty overview of this. And the reason I want to point it out at all is because um, it is so different than how animals do reproduction. Okay? So, alternation of generation is what I want you guys to know. And all this stuff is in your study guide, too. Remember, I went through the study guide, I marked out stuff in red that you don't have to know. So, if it's still in, if not in red, then you should know it. So this is all on there, okay? leading you to this information. So, I want you to know that alternation of generations is the name for the life cycle that plants use where an organism has both haploid and diploid multicellular stages. And what is diploid? What does that mean? What kind of, what's going on in your cells if you're diploid? We talk about ploidy level, talking about number of something. To what? Set, uh, hmm? Kind of. So you've got to have two in order to get a diploid cell. Right? Maybe let's start with haploid since we're heading in that direction. What does haploid mean? If diploid means two, what do you think haploid means? Hmm? One. Yeah. So we're talking about number of sets of chromosomes. Okay? So you your cells are diploid. How many sets of chromosomes do you have? Yeah, you have well, you have 23 pairs, right? So two sets of 23. Does that make sense? What I'm talking about? You have 23 chromosomes, but you have one set from mom, one set from dad. So you're diploid, you've got two sets. So a haploid cell has one set. Haploid cells are things like sperm and eggs, right? And they combine and you get karyogamy and you get, um, you get that nuclear fusion and then you have a diploid zygote. For us, for animals, the only 
haploid cell R gametes. And how many cells? I'm really going to stretch you guys here. How many cells are get? How many cells large are gametes? Are they multicellular or are they just single cells? Single cells, right? Sperm and egg. But that's the only way they exist. There are no other life stages in which that we as animals are haploid. The only haploid cells are gametes. Okay, with plants, it's different. They have a whole life stage that is multicellular. Okay, as opposed to single cells like a gamete, they have a haploid, haploid multicellular stage and they have a diploid multicellular stage. That's why it's called alternation of generation haploid, diploid, haploid, diploid. And both of them are contributing to the reproduction process. Okay. Do you see how that's different than how animals do it? We are uh, almost entirely diploid. The only cells we ever see are, that are haploid are gametes and those are single cells. So that's the difference between the two strategies. Okay, so this is a really interesting um, adaptation in plant reproduction that we see. I'm going to run through these really quickly. Most of these terms have been uh, marked out on your study guide. So I just have to tell you the story so that it makes sense. Um, the parts I want you to know make sense. And I can't do that without using these terms. So I'm going to introduce them, but you don't have to memorize most of them. Okay? The haploid gametophyte gives rise to haploid gametes through mitosis. So this haploid gametophyte, that is the generation, the haploid multicellular generation. It is um, this side of the diagram. Okay? It's multicellular, so it looks like a little plant. It's not just a single cell, and it's giving rise to gametes. Okay? It's making sperm and egg cells. And those sperm and egg cells are going to fuse to form a diploid zygote. Okay, that starts the second alternation or the second alternate generation, the diploid phase. That's a diploid zygote. It grows into a sporophyte. So I'm somewhere. Zygote divides through mitosis to develop a diploid sporophyte. And the sporophyte then produces haploid spores through meiosis. Okay? You don't have to know this step in detail. We're going to cut that out. We don't really have time to go through it in, in enough detail to where I expect you to be able to tell me about it on an exam. But what's basically happening, just to make the story make sense, is that you have a multicellular plant that is making sperm cells or egg cells. Those two gametes fuse, make a zygote that grows into a multicellular second life stage. Then this one makes spores. Okay, the spores grow into the gametophyte, which is the multicellular haploid stage, and then that little plant makes gametes. So it's basically just a two, two different life stages, two entirely different forms of life. For reproduction in plants. Now, when you see an oak tree, for example, or a lily, or I don't know, the daffodils in your yard, those are all angiosperms. Those are all flowering plants. Those are all modern plants. Okay. They still do this, but you can't see both stages. You only ever just see the one plant. Okay. You see the sporophyte phase, the diploid phase. So all the tissue that you see in a general plant that you find outside is going to be a sporophyte. And the uh, gametophyte is hidden inside of that sporophyte. The reason I'm even bringing this up at all is because we're going to look at flowers. And when we get there, you'll see how all of this stuff, all of this gamete, uh, gamete formation and spore formation, this whole cycle is still going on, but it's going on inside the reproductive structures in the flower. It's really pretty cool. So we're gonna, this is just introducing why the flower is such a good innovation for reproduction. All right, so you don't have to know all these details. I just want you to know what alternation of generations is and that it means there are two life phases. Both are multicellular. Both are visible plant forms, at least in early plants like mosses, okay? So when you look at a moss, this, this is an extreme close-up, right? So you guys all know what moss looks like. So this stuff here, this sort of fuzzy, Green stuff, that sort of soft blanket that you see on the forest floor when I draw the side of a, of a path that you're walking through the woods. That's gametophyte tissue. These little um, stalks with these little lighter green structures on top, that, those are sporophytes. So they grow together, one grows on the other. Spores are being formed in these little sacs. But most of what you see is gametophyte tissue. That switches when you get to something like an oak tree, and the whole thing you're seeing here is the sporophyte. So all I, all I want you to know is just, this is just part of the story. I'm not going to ask you specific questions about sporophyte versus gametophyte or any of that. 
This is just part of the story. Okay, you guys okay with that? I tried to cut as much of it out as I could and still make the rest of it make sense. So hopefully that works. Okay, questions about that? I know that was really rough and you're kind of probably confused, but use your study guide to know what I want you to know and what I don't. Okay, basically you're not going to see any questions about any of this terminology or any of that. It's just part of getting us to where we need to be. You guys are okay with that? You guys are happy with that? Graphs, you have a captive audience. Okay. Let me know if you have questions as you're studying. Um, when you run through the Kahoot, you shouldn't see any questions about this stuff. I think I took out any of the ones that were related to um, alternation generation. All right, let's see if we can get through the major divisions of land plants in the next 45 minutes. That's the goal. All right. Um, there are four major classifications non vascular, seedless vascular, gymnosperms, and angiosperms. From that first slide from this chapter, um, we mentioned all of these a little bit. Uh, do you remember non vascular? Like, how many of these guys are there? A lot or a few? Few, right? Which of these four groups is the most abundant now? You guys remember? Hmm? They said something. Can't hear you inside of my plastic hat here sometimes. Angiosperm, okay? These are your flowering plants. 95%, give or take, of plants that you are familiar with are flowering plants, okay? So that we've seen. Uh, gymnosperms, we'll talk about those are your cone bearers, things like pine trees. Okay, we'll talk about that briefly. And then seedless vascular plants, you guys have seen these if you've been to the preserve. When we went on our walk around the lake, and I pointed out that big field of club moss. I told you that you can use the spores to light them on fire. Do you guys remember that? Those are seedless vascular plants. So we'll talk about all four of these, but these are the four major groups. Um, you got a nice little table that sort of breaks it down for you. Um, but we're going to go through each one of these um, briefly, but individually. All right, so non-vascular plants, another name for this group are the bryophytes. These are your true mosses, okay? These are most likely what the earliest land plants would have looked like. Okay? Not that these were the first land plants to exist, because the first land plants to exist are not here anymore, okay? So these are descendants of, all land plants are descendants of, but these uh, bryophytes have a lot of the same characteristics that you would have expected to see in early land plants. Um, so I mentioned mosses, those are on here. You've also got uh, liverworts, which is this, and hornworts. Have you guys ever heard of liverworts or hornworts? Some of you are nodding. You must have had plant, a plant biologist for a teacher before, or you were into plants. Into plants? Okay. That makes sense. Most people are like, what's a liverwort? Right? Um, they grow really low to the ground, just like mosses. Um, they reproduce using spores, no seeds yet, also no vascular tissue, no xylem, no phloem. All right, so transport, remember we talked about the vascular elements, and those vascular elements are used to move water and nutrients around the plant. So those, vas those vessels for transport allow for the plant to get taller, right, and put on more tissue. Because if you can move nutrients and you can move water over longer distances, then you can afford to grow. These dudes don't have that ability. They don't have vascularity. So any of the um, transport that has to happen of water or nutrients or waste removal, all has to happen through diffusion, which limits the size that these things can take on. Okay, so they stay really low. They don't get huge. Um, they also have to stay close to the water or at least in a damp habitat because their spores, um, their, I'm sorry, their gametes are flagellated, so they swim, all right? So in the case of something like those, uh, like a moss that you may see growing, it doesn't mean that the moss has to be underwater in order for its gametophytes to produce gametes to swim to each other. It can be as much as raindrops, all right? So it can just be uh, a damp habitat where it stays kind of moist and then a raindrop splashes down on this guy and moves a gamete over here. And so it doesn't have to travel very far. It can just be like splashy water. But it still has to be, you're still looking at dependence on moisture for reproduction in this group. All right, so mm, yeah, we've talked about all of that. That's pretty much it for non vascular plants. They're still around. You've seen mosses. I maybe can show you some liverworts at some point. Uh, I mean, hornworts hard to find in Georgia. But if we come across any of this, I'll show you. 
with the list. But for now, just know that they, they classify them as food. That's it for non vascular plants. Okay, seedless vascular, there are two groups that you guys need to know the lycophytes, which include the club moth. This is exactly the same species that we saw at the preserve. Um, quill warts, which are largely aquatic, at least for reproduction, um, and spike mosses. Okay, so these are, even though they're called club moss and spike moss, they're not really mosses. That's just tricky. Okay, the real mosses are in the bryophytes, the non vascular. These guys are vascular. So they can get a little bigger. Do you guys remember those club mosses out of the um, preserve? They're like maybe this high off the ground. That's huge compared to a moss, right? Because these guys can put on size because they have xylem and they have flow. Um, there is a video I'm going to have linked in here in the PowerPoint. I definitely want you guys to watch it and you will see questions on the exam. And I'll, I'll point that out when we get there. But this group um, gave rise to coal. Most of the coal deposits that we use today came from trees that are closely related to these flood mosses um, that grew in what we now call the Carboniferous period. We call it Carboniferous because a lot of carbon was laid down uh, in that era. So those guys are significant for that reason. Um, but they're called seedless vascular. So xylem and phloem, check, right? Yes to the vascular. What about seeds? Well, they're called seedless. So there's your hint, right? So what do you think they do? Seeds haven't evolved yet. What are they doing? Same thing as these guys. Same thing as algae spores. Okay. Remember we talked about those fun moss spores. You can line them on fire, right? They don't make seeds. They make spores. All right. The second group of seedless vascular plants are the pterophytes, and you've definitely seen these if you've been out to the preserve because these guys are everywhere. Not wood ferns, Christmas ferns, but still ferns, right? You guys have probably all seen a fern like this in your life, even just hanging on somebody's front porch, right? Those guys are also seedless vascular. This picture is kind of cool. You can see these little clusters underneath the, um, that's the bottom layer of a fern leaf. Those are where the spores are housed. Okay, so again, they don't make seeds, they make spores. Um, this group is a little bit more advanced evolutionarily than things like club moss, quill wart, spike moss. So they're in these two different groups. Um, taro means wing. I don't know if that helps. Let's think about like a pterodactyl. You guys know what a pterodactyl is? A flying dinosaur relative. Um, so taro means wing. Um, that may be helpful to remember because the ferns are kind of wing. They're, the fern fronds look kind of like wings. That's why they're called pterophytes. So if you can remember that, it might help you remember who belongs in this group. Um, other examples are horsetails and wisp ferns, which look a little different than your typical sort of fern that you think about. But these guys are all just examples in that same group. So what I'm going to ask you would be um, examples of species, and then do they have seeds? Yes or no. Do they have vascularity? Yes or no. That's basically it. But you guys, the first group is called non-vascular. Okay. You with me? The answer to the question is right there in the name of the group, and the same thing with seedless vascular. Okay, seeds, no, vascular, yeah. Okay, all right. Um, why do we care about these guys, even though they're largely in the minority? Well, um, there's several good reasons to care. Um, mosses work well as bioindicators, we can tell the health of an ecosystem by the health of the mosses in it, that they belong there. Um, it has a lot to do with the fact that they don't have roots. And they don't have true leaves and they don't have a cuticle. So, this is early, early um, ancestral conditions in these plants, which means that if water lands on that tissue, there's no waxy cuticle to protect it. So, anything that's in that water can seep right into the tissue. So, if it's polluted or if it's acidic or if it's too alkaline, those types of things will affect the tissue more uh, readily of something like a moss than it would like an oak tree that has a cuticle layer to protect it. So these guys work well to indicate ecosystem health. So there's a good reason. Um, sphagnum is a type of moss, peat moss, that we use often as fuel. We grow cranberries in it. So that's another sort of interesting example. But the most significant contribution, this is the one I want you guys to take a look at. I want you to watch this video. Okay? I will uh, try to remember to remind you that on, on uh, D2L later this week, right before the exam opens. This is all about how these seedless vascular plants came to uh, give us coal, okay? And coal is responsible for the industrial revolution and life as we know it today. 
right? As much as it's uh, impactful on the environment in a negative way, it's very, very important in human history. Yes, and, and present, human present. Um, but the video is going to very nicely cover how it got there. And then when we talk about climate change towards the end of the semester, we'll revisit this topic and we'll talk about how burning that coal that was laid down in the Carboniferous period contributes to the warming uh, of the climate. Okay, so this is critical. I don't really care that you know a ton about this stuff, but this is really, really important. Okay, yes, everybody got that. Okay, you'll see questions from that, from that video. That's the end of 25. We're doing great. We're gonna make it. I was like stressing out this morning. I have to talk about flowers. So important. It really is. Okay, doing okay? Remember, we're gonna finish this today and then we'll meet again Wednesday and start animals before you ever even have to take this test. So you have some days to digest all this stuff. I know it sounds like I'm coming at you quick with this material. Which I am, but you'll be all right. We got a few days to, to assimilate. All right, remember I told you chapter 25 and 26, really they're just a continuation of one another. Um, all of the characteristics that we talked about of land plants obviously apply to, to uh, gymnosperms and angiosperms, which are your seed plants, and they're land plants. Okay, so we're just going to roll forward. Um, before we start talking about the groups, I'm going to give you some characteristics that are unique to plants that make seeds. Okay, so this is going to be just your gymnosperms and your angiosperms. Um, another term for a seed bearing plant is a spermatophyte. Okay, phyte often just means plant. Okay, so you'll see that root word a lot. And then sperm means seed or kernel, something along those lines if you go back to the Greek. So seed plants, spermatophytes. Um, not a huge deal, just another piece of terminology. Um, so seed plants have, you guessed it, seeds. We'll talk about why those are important. Um, and pollen. So before you get to seed plants, when you're looking at non-vascular plants like mosses and um, seedless vascular plants like ferns and, and club mosses, those don't make pollen either. Not only do they don't have seeds, but they also don't make pollen. What's in the pollen, you might ask? Why is that so important? Well, pollen grains, uh, include the male gametophytes. And if you recall from our brief discussion on uh, alternation of generations, gametophytes are just the part of the plant that make the, the sex cell, that make the gametes, okay? So the male gamete producing cells are inside the pollen grains. So what that means is that sperm are produced inside these individual pollen grains and the grain itself, this is just a micrograph, so a microscope picture, it's really, really close up to a pollen grain. Did you guys know that it looked that, that fancy? You look at them close, there's lots of different shapes and um, morphologies to pollen grains, it's kind of interesting. But you're really looking at a spaceship for plant sperm. All right? Breaking it down, how it is. It's just a, a dispersal mechanism. It's pretty clever when you think about it as an adaptation to reproduction on land. Because what happens to a, a gamete, a sperm cell, in the air, out of the water, and dry out, right? That's what we're talking about when we're looking at reproductive adaptations to life on land. Pollen grains are a great one. Now your gametes are inside of a tough, outer, drought-resistant coating to get from place to place. How does pollen move around? Wind, sometimes, how else? Pollinators, yeah, wind or animals, right? In most cases, bugs like butterflies or bees or moths, bats, birds, mammals, right? Moving pollen from one place to another. So it's a delivery system for sperm, for plants. Um, ovules are the female gametophytes. So inside of a flower, you can sort of see the parts. We'll look at some diagrams here in just a second. But inside of the ovary, tissue, you've got ovules. So they're little bitty um, collections of cells that contain the cells that make the eggs. Um, so pollen basically lands here and travels down to the ovules. Fertilization happens in here and that's gonna grow into a seed. All right, so seeds are formed from ovules that are fertilized by sperm that are carried inside of pollen grain. 
Now, this is another adaptation to reproduction on land because you're protecting your gametes from drying out by housing them inside of this ovule structure. And you're also providing protection for developing seed. Okay, so if the seed forms from a fertilized ovule, you get pollen with the, delivering the sperm. If fertilization happens here, that, uh, that ovule is going to mature into a seed. That seed contains the diploid embryo. You guys follow? Zygote, right? Sperm plus egg happens in the ovule. You get the first diploid cell. The zygote forms there. The zygote begins to divide and becomes an embryo, just like in an animal. And it's growing inside of a seed coat. Okay? Think in terms of adaptation to reproduction on land. You're protecting that zygote. You're protecting that developing embryo. That's your baby plant inside of that seed. So this is another incredibly important step in the evolution of land plants, because now you can move away from water. You are able to uh, exploit or take advantage of additional environments that you potentially could not have taken advantage of when you were still tied to water for reproduction. But if you've got your sperm in a capsule and you've got your eggs protected inside of the plant and you've got a seed coat on, around your embryo, the world is yours. Does that make sense, you guys? So you've got all this protection from drying out um, and now, now you're mobile. You can be carried from one place to another and you can colonize. Um, seeds also allow for dormancy. You guys know what a dormant seed does? Not much. Right? You've got some really slow, low levels of enzymatic reaction going on. So it's not dead, but it's essentially waiting until conditions are favorable. So if you live somewhere like here, where you have four distinct seasons, distinct-ish, I mean, we have hot and cold in Georgia, but um, when do you generally start thinking about seeing flowers? What time of the year, season? Spring, right? April showers, spring May flowers, you guys all heard that, right? So flowering plants, you usually see most of the flowers around spring. Some stuff is out now, it's subtle, but it's out there. Um, flowers produce seeds. Okay, so seeds are going to set in late summer, early fall. And then when do you see new plants coming up again? The next spring, right? So what happens between fall and spring? Dormancy. Yep. So in this type of uh, climate that's temperate like this, where we get a cold season, those seeds can chill. That was not intentional. That was not, that, I did not mean to make a pun. But hang out, right? Over the winter, during cold temperatures, while conditions are not favorable for germination or sprouting, but that seed allows it to be, it doesn't dry out, it can hang out in there and wait until it's warmer, it's wetter, and then it can germinate. Okay, so it's a really good adaptation to, to life on land for reproduction. Super important. Can't express enough how important seeds are to uh, plant evolution. Questions on this stuff? All right, so these are the characteristics that are unique to seed plants, basically the seed and all the cool stuff that comes along with it um, and pulp, okay, as a delivery system for the male gametes. All right, let's look at these lineages. We've got gymnosperms and angiosperms left to cover. Again, remember the vast majority of extant plant species are spermatophytes or seed plants. Remind me one more time, what does extant mean? Yeah, around, here, not extinct. Yeah, still living. Um, adaptations have made these lineages so successful at life on land, seeds and pollen. You see that in every one of the spermatophytes and flowers and fruits in angiosperms. So if you thought I was excited about seeds, wait till you get the flowers, you guys. Um, so here's your little chart again. We talked about our bryophytes. I don't know why they make this side of the table so big, because remember, there are so few of those. Those are your mosses, little warts and more warts. Seedless plants, you got your club moss group. You got your ferns. Here we are in seed plants. Okay, again, this is not proportional to the number of species because most species, again, are angiosperms. Um, plant phylogeny, this is just a visit to the tree. Here's our, our sister, paraphytes. Okay, those are your algae that came from this population of ancestral green algae that also gave rise to all of the embryophytes. There's your mosses, there's your uh, club mosses, there's your ferns. We're all the way down here. Okay, we've covered everything else on the tree other than your spermatophytes, and that's where we are living right now. 
Ready? Gymnosperms, four groups. Okay. Gymnosperms uh, arrived somewhere around 350 million years ago during the Mesozoic. They're the major plant on the planet. You know what else was around during the Mesozoic? The large dinosaurs that all went extinct at the KPG boundary. So when you think, when you picture like dinosaurs roaming the earth, you can also picture big cone trees along with them, because that would have been what the landscape was dominated by during that period of time. Gymnosperm means naked seed. Okay, so remember sperm means seed, gymno means naked. Now I don't know how that how you will remember that gymno means naked, but you can think about changing out for gym class, maybe. And that's a good way to remember it. It's actually called that because they used to play sports naked back in like ancient Greece. Okay, people do weird stuff. Anyway, that means naked seed. Okay, it's naked because it doesn't have an ovary. All right, we're gonna look at the structure of flowers here in a little while. So these guys aren't flowers. Remember, only the angiosperms make flowers. So gymnosperms have seeds and they have pollen, but they don't have flowers. Okay, and they don't make fruit. What do they make? Well, they have seeds and pollen and they store them in structures called stroboli, which we know as cones. So your gymnosperms are your cone bearers. Okay, they don't make flowers, but they make cones. You guys have all seen a pine cone, yes? I should have brought one. I have a big one in my office. Probably a bunch of them, but you guys know what cones look like. And these are mostly wind pollinated. So when we talk about how the pollen moves around, and the first answer we get is wind, that's how this works in almost every example of gymnosperm. So animal pollinators are also going to come later with flowers. Okay, with the evolution of flowers. There's one exception. We'll look at that in just a second. Here's your four groups I want you to know: conifers, cycads, ginkgo, and neophytes. We'll take a quick look, quick tour through those groups here. Conifers, um, probably the most diverse group in uh, the gymnosperm, the most diverse phylum. You've got pine trees, you've got cypress trees, uh, cedar, yew, hemlock, all your Christmas trees, firs, right? Those are all going to be pine-ish cone-bearing trees, okay? Um, that's really all there is to say about that. The big trees. Waxy leaves, you guys know what those uh, pine type or fir type leaves look like probably. If you have um, ever encountered a tree that looks like a Christmas tree. They have these needle-like leaves. Like they're waxy and they're thin. They are great for um, making snow slide right off. All right, so when you, these are good, uh, well adapted for high elevation. They're well adapted for dry, cold climates. So that um, they're waxy and they're small, those needle-like leaves keep water floss at a minimum. Okay, so that's an adaptation to those dry, cold seasons um, and high elevation. But again, it helps with snow. When it snows down here, our native species of trees are not really well adapted to that type of uh, snowfall and the weight of it happens, what happens to the trees? Hmm? Yeah, limbs fall off, the power lines get knocked down, it's terrible, right? Because our trees aren't well adapted for snowfall and like that, but these guys are, okay, they can handle it. Um, both through, both because they're tough and also because those leaves cause, uh, don't, they don't hold on to the snow path like our trees do. So cone trees, pretty straightforward. Everybody's seen a cone tree, yes? If you haven't, we'll go outside and I'll show you. All right, cycads. You've seen cycads, even if you don't know you've seen cycads. Um, you might have thought it was a palm. They look very much like palm leaves. This is a good example, okay? Um, they're used a lot in uh, landscape, particularly indoor landscape, like in the mall. Okay. I think there used to be one, I don't know if it's still in there, but by the library, like a big pot with a big palm looking thing in it. Those are cycads. They're sometimes called sago palms. You may have heard that, that's sort of a colloquial name or a common name for them, but they're not palm trees. Palm trees are angiosperms. They make flowers, they make fruit, coconuts. Yes, cycads do not make coconuts, they don't make fruit at all because they're gymnosperms. That's what the cone looks like. Okay, cycads are um, interesting for those reasons. They look like palm trees. They also make cones. And here's your exception to the wind pollination because sometimes these guys are pollinated by beetles. There's your one exception to the animal pollination in the gymnosperm. That's pretty much it for cycads. Okay, look like palms, not big cones, beetle pollinated. 
Uh, ginkgo is an interesting phylum. The ginkgo phytes consist of eight single species called ginkgo biloba. Anybody ever heard of ginkgo? You're nodding. What do you know about ginkgo, Diana? No, the fruits that they produce, they stink. Yes, they do. The females make the, the and we call them, we talk about them as fruits. They kind of look like big berries. They're actually uh, female cones. Because these guys aren't fruit bearing, he's a gymnast burn, so they kind of look like fruits. When they fall off and start to rot up on the ground, they smell like rancid butter. I don't know if you've ever smelled rancid butter, but butyric acid is not a pleasant smell. Um, so, and these are these are the types of plants where it's either a male tree or a female tree. So when these are frequently used in landscaping as well, because the leaves are really pretty, they have these weird sort of flat fan-like leaves, but landscapers will only plant the males. And if you're putting these around like your bank or shopping center, you don't want rancid butter smell coming out all over the place and when uh, the fleshy seeds drop off. These guys are also interesting because they're kind of a living fossil. So ginkgo uh, looks the same now as fossil ginkgo. So that's a fossilized weed of a ginkgo. So these dudes have changed a whole lot um, over evolutionary time. And there's a good possibility the only reason they're still around is because they're treasured and cultivated by Chinese monks. So maybe they would have gone the way of the rest of the ginkgo bites and gone extinct, if not for that continuous cultivation by people. So that's kind of interesting too. Only species in the phylum, ginkgo biloba, stinky seeds, living fossil. The last group are the neophytes. Um, and the neophytes are an interesting group. A couple of different genera that are uh, really different from one another. So we'll talk about three. The three genera, Needham, Lelwichia, and Ephedra. Needham, I don't even have a picture because it's kind of boring, but we have to mention it because it's the name from which the phylum gets its root, so the plant from which, let me say that sentence again, the plant from which the phylum gets its name. Um, but Ephedra and Lelwichia are a little bit more interesting. So this is Lelwichia mirabilis. This is a native planted in the mid-desert. It is unique because it only ever grows two leaves in its entire life, but they keep growing. So each one of these pots in this picture is housing a single Lelwichia with two leaves. The cone grows right there in the middle of the two, and they just curl, they grow and curl. If you break one off, you might kill the plant because that's all it's got, those two leaves. Everything it has except for those two leaves that grow for its entire lifetime. So that's kind of interesting. And then ephedra is another interesting one um, because this is the plant that makes toxic alkaloids that are precursors to the medication that we call pseudoephedrine, uh, active ingredient in pseudofed, right? What is that for? You guys know? You go to the pharmacy and pick up some pseudofed, what's wrong with it? Nobody knows? It's a decongestant, and right? it's used for to decrease nasal congestion in most cases. Um, Anybody work at a pharmacy or know anyone who works at a pharmacy? Anybody know anything about Sudafed or restrictions on purchasing Sudafed? Say again? Yeah, it's the pseudoephedrine that can be used as a precursor to make pistol meth. So if you have a cold and you go to the store um, and you want the Sudafed to treat your congestion, you got to go to the pharmacy and they will look at your driver's license and they'll record how many tablets they sold you. And if you come back the next week and you want another 48 tablets, they might sell you 48 more, but if you come back after that, they're gonna cut you off because people actually go around buying as much Sudafed as they can from various pharmacies because you can then sell it to somebody who's gonna cook that. Anybody watch Breaking Bad? Probably wonder what I'm talking about. So that's the plant that pseudoephedrine comes from. So that's kind of an interesting one as well. Sort of notable in the same way that, um, uh, what's the one? I'm going blank. The LSD, or not fungus. One of my stripper or something. And that's just anyway. I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on that one, but the one that makes LSD, the fungus. Anyway, here's a plant that gives you uh, math with some chemistry stuff. Interesting. So those are the neophytes. Those are all of your gymnosperms. All right, angiosperms in 15 minutes. We can do this. Most dominant group because of the flowers and the fruits. We'll look at why. Um, again, 94%, give or take a little bit, are angiosperms. Sperm still means seed. Okay? Angio means vessel. Like, uh, what is an angioplasty? Has anyone ever heard of someone having an angioplasty? Or angiotensin drugs? Somebody with a medical background. Um, angio, we use it in terms of blood vessels. 
and angioplasty would be an operation on your blood vessels. But angio means vessel. And in this case, we're talking about the ovary. The vessel is the ovary. Okay, the ovary is the vessel. Um, here are the nice diagrams. So this is going to be helpful because there are going to be some plant parts that you guys will need to be able to label uh, for angiosperms. This structure here, this orange sort of oval, that's the ovary. Right? It's, a, it's tissue that houses those ovules. Okay? This is unique to angiosperms, but it's protecting those developing seeds. Now, gymnosperms still make seeds, remember, but they're protected inside of cones. Okay, so this is a different type of structure. Um, flowers are used for lots of things, including attracting those animal pollinators. So flowers are pretty, but they're not just pretty for the fun of it, right? They're colored to attract pollinators. They smell good to attract pollinators. Some of them smell bad to attract pollinators. If you're trying to get flies to come to you, you're probably going to smell like rotting meat as opposed to, you know, roses. So some, some plants do that. Um, lots of diversity in flowers. Some are huge, some are so tiny you need a hand lens to see them. But inside of those flowers, you're going to find the same structures, the same reproductive parts. Um, and those are the ones I'm going to show you here in just a second that you'll need to know. Flowers give rise to fruits. So fruits are only formed after you have a flower, a, a plant flowers, okay? Because those seeds are developing inside those ovules, the ovules become the seeds. The seeds are developing inside the ovary. So it is some piece of tissue around this part of the flower that will become the fruit. Okay, so we'll look at some examples of that as well. For, uh, fruits form as seeds grow inside the ovary and the ovary walls thicken. So that's a generalization of how that happens. Fruits can be uh, fleshy, like we think of berries, apples, things like that, that have nice, juicy, sugar filled, water filled uh, tissue that are, that's delicious. But you can also see dry fruits. Okay, so fruit is really just the ovary tissue around the developing seeds. Okay, so we'll look at some examples. Um, fruits are agents of seed dispersal. So we talked about pollen as an agent of sperm dispersal. Yes? Sperm spaceship. Seeds are dispersal for the baby plant itself. If you are um, a non-modal rooted plant and you make all these offspring in seeds and your seeds drop down to the ground right below where you grow and they germinate, you have just produced yourself a whole population of competitors. Yes? What are you going to compete for with all of your offspring? Light water, soil nutrition, right? So you really don't want to do that. It's not a great strategy. So the idea is I can't move. I'm rooted. How do I get my seeds away from me? Not just away from me, but to other suitable places to grow. And so that's what seeds, and that's what fruits are really for, is to carry those seeds away. So remember the seeds are inside the fruit. Think about an apple, right? Where are the seeds? Cut an apple in half, you can find them inside, right? Right in the middle. So that's a good, um, a good visual. Lots of um, things that you think of as vegetables are actually fruits. So if there's a seed inside, it's a fruit. Okay? So that's easy when you think about things like oranges or apples. But when you start thinking about things like squash, you don't usually think about it as a fruit, right? You think of it as a vegetable. Yes. What about um, oh cucumber? Fruit or vegetable? It's fruit. That's seeds inside. What about tomato? Fruit. That's seeds inside of it. Now, if you're arguing with a chef, the fight will go on all day. So, chef versus botanist, you know, it's a never-ending argument because there's a difference between classifying a, a, a botanical fruit versus a culinary fruit or a vegetable. Okay, so yeah, it's fair if you're a cook or a chef to call something that's savory a vegetable and something that's sweet a fruit. Okay, that's allowed. But if you're a botanist, you better get it right. So there are actually vegetables, things that come from other parts of the plant that aren't flowers, not flower parts, things like stems or roots or leaves, like lettuce, vegetable, potato, vegetable. Okay, no seeds, other parts of the plant. All right, uh, let's see. We'll look a little bit at dispersal mechanism. 
Oh, before we do that, here's just a couple of quick pictures of some fruits. Oh, peas, that's a good one I didn't think of. Generally, you think of that as a peach. Your peas, eat your vegetables, right? These are fruits, come from the inside of the flower. There's the ovary, see? There's a little ovule dangling inside there. The petals wilt and fall off after this is pollinated, and these guys are the seeds. Those are baby pea plants, okay? Uh, raspberry, pineapple even, and there's your apple. Okay, so just sort of giving you some visuals of those uh, tissues and how they're arranged. All right, how does fruit function to disperse seeds? You guys know what that is? Yeah, the dandelion. Each one of these little uh, dry, hard structures at the end of this little tuft is a fruit. Okay, inside of that hard ovary tissue is the seed, actually inside of that tiny thing. And what are those fluffy things for? Yeah, floating on the wind, right? So this is dispersing seeds inside of this little fruit every time some kid goes out and picks a big line of it, right? Or just the wind can do it too, or animals walking by. Um, let's see, how about this? Do you guys know what that is? The coconut. So the furry brown sort of husk, the guar husk, is inside of this actual big seed coat. These guys are water dispersed mostly, they float. Um, what is this guy doing? What is that? The squirrel, yeah. It's an Avery's Cavalier squirrel, my favorite. Let me see it. Anyway, what do they do with seeds? Hmm? They bury them, yeah, they hoard. So they'll go collect acorns, right, and dig a little hole, or they'll put them in a tree in a hole in a tree somewhere. They cache them, right? And so they can go back later and get them. Are squirrels the smartest animal you've ever seen? Okay, they're not really nice. You ever watch them? Anyway, they do their thing, but they're not. What I'm saying is they might forget where they put that, right? But you can take a whole bunch of acorns. What kind of a plant makes acorns? Do you guys know? Where do acorns, acorns come from? Oak tree, yeah. So the oak tree, here's a good example of a, a seed that you do just drop, right? Because they're heavy and there's no wings like this on it. So how do you get your seeds to disperse? Well, you rely on an animal to do it, right? So that's another good reason, a good example of fruits as an agent of seed dispersal, because this guy goes and gets it, and it's like, ha ha, I found something good, and then I'm gonna take it over here and gonna hide it. There's like 25 more of them. Maybe I'm gonna eat all 25 of them, but maybe I'm just gonna chew on a few and forget where I put it. That's the point, that's the strategy that the oak tree is relying on, right? Animal fruit dispersal. Okay, um, let's see, what about this? What's stuck to this dog? Little like um, birds, right? So these are fruits with spiky coatings on that get stuck in the fur of, of, of mammals or on your, on your jeans or your, pant, or your pants when you're out in the field, right? You ever gone somewhere and then gotten home and you had a bunch of stuff stuck to your boot strings or your pant leg? That's a fruit being dispersed by an animal. And it didn't evolve to stick to your pants, but mammal for sure. Um, this is my favorite one to talk about. You guys are going to, I mean, you already think I'm weird, so I got nothing to lose. But um, when an animal eats a fruit, this is the most elegant and most complex system of seed dispersal of all of them. Because the animal eats the fruit, then does it just sit there where it ate the fruit? Not usually, right? It's going to trot off and do something else. And then a few hours later, who knows how far that animal has gone by then, it has to go to the bathroom, right? When it does, these seeds, now they're inside of the seed coat, right? These embryonic plants are inside of that seed coat with the tuck, and they can withstand this, the acid in this vertebrate's digestive tract. When the animal poops it out, it's far away from where it ate it, hypothetically, but it's also delivered in a pile of fertilizer. This is the, the best system of all. Biologically speaking. You guys see what I'm talking about? When you go to buy fertilizer at the farm supply store, what do you often purchase? Hmm? Manure, right? Because it's loaded with organic nutrition. Pretty good system. Yes? Just saying. Okay, cool. Flower parts to know. You guys will need to be able to label a flower diagram, okay? So I'm gonna leave this largely to you because we are running out of time to go over this in a whole lot of detail. If it's in bold, 
You need to know what it is. Okay, I'll show you very quickly. Sepals, the outer structure on the outside of the flower. When a flower bud is closed, they protect all the inside pieces. When the flower opens, the sepals become the outermost piece. They're usually green. Not always, but in this case, we'll stick with that. Petals are next, right? Inside the sepals or on top of the sepals when the flower opens. Those are usually the color, colorful part. Um, stamens are filament plus anthers. The anthers are where the pollen is made, okay? And that's the filament. So together, those are stamens. Uh, pollen grades are inside the anther. Carpels are stigma plus style plus ovary. So ovary here, stigma is the sticky part of the top and the style is the tube between. So think sticky stigma. Pollen lands here, that's why it's sticky. Okay, onto the stigma. And then the pollen, one of the cells, this is cool too, one of the cells in the pollen grain starts to make a pollen tube, which is basically just drilling down through the style to get to the various ovules. Then sperm are delivered through that pollen tube and fertilization happens in there. Okay, so the female parts, stigma style ovary, male parts, filament anther. Um, ovules we talked about, those are inside of the ovary. That's what's going to become the seed once that um, egg is fertilized. And then uh, these are just terms to, dis to discuss the flower itself. So don't worry about that. I went off to the just cool terminology. Just the reproductive parts and the sepals and parts. Okay. Just label a diagram that looks very similar to something like that. Oh, let's see. Time to talk about monocots and eudicots. I think we do. Five minutes. Okay. Um, have you guys heard about monocots and eudicots before? Or monocots and dicots? Have you heard that classification? Some of you are nodding. Most of you are not. Okay. So, quick phylogeny. Here are your living gymnosperms outside of, of uh, flowering plants. Most recent common ancestor of all angiosperms, there are outgroups, sister groups that don't belong in monocots and eudicots, but these are exceptions. These would be basal lineages. You guys remember from our phylogenetic tree discussion, basal lineages are those that branch off early and don't diversify much. So you get things like water lilies, magnolias that are in these basal groups. But most plants are either going to be monocots or eudicots. And all I'm going to ask you to do is classify a plant based on these characteristics that make monocots and eudicots different from each other. There are six characteristics on this list. I will ask you about three of them out of the six. Okay? So you have to know what a cotyledon is because the group is called monocot and eudicot. Okay? The cot is short for cotyledon. A cotyledon is a seed leaf, right? Inside of the seed, there's one seed leaf. It's not photosynthetic. It's just the baby, the first baby leaf, or there are two. Which group do you think has one? Monocot or dicot? What? Monocots, right? One cotyledon. So that's a good characteristic. Two cotyledons, dicot. Remember, EU just means you. I mean, EU means true. True dicot, two cotyledons. Okay, so that's one of the ones I'll ask you about. Um, leaf venation. This is a good one because you can see this really easily. If you look at a blade of grass and you look at how the veins, the vascular structures are running, they're running parallel to each other. You guys know what I'm talking about? Go pick a blade of grass and look at it. Then go pick up a leaf from a tree out there and look at how the venation is branched. It's net like venation. That's a eudicot trait versus a monocot trait. Grass is a monocot. Um, don't worry about bundles of vascular tissue. Don't worry about tap roots. Don't worry about pollen grains, because I'm certainly not going to give you a pollen grain and ask you to have one hole or three. I'm not going to do that to you. Uh, but I will ask you about floral formula, because you can look at the flower and tell this in lots of cases. Uh, floral organs in multiple three, that's a monocot thing. Multiples of four or five, that's a eudicot thing. When I say floral organs, I mean number of petals, number of stamens, okay, things like that. Things that you can dissect apart a flower and count the pieces and tell me this is a, probably a monocot and this is probably a eudicot. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. So, this is all just memorizing stuff. Um, so, you guys can do that on your own. Well, there are some typical monocot flowers 
three petals. Three, those are these are actually sepals in the iris. One, two, three, petals, one, two, three. Um, you can count the anthers on this one, one, two, three, one, two, three, six, multiple three. And those are monocots. Eudicots, four, five. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. They're not all like this, they don't all follow that same pattern, but it's a good indicator. So that's what I want you guys to know. We're skipping pollination altogether, even though that's the most interesting stuff to talk about. Really interesting story. And then what do we use plants for? So we've already talked about this. Okay. Food, medicine, clothing, industry, biodiversity, conservation. We've talked about all that before. That's it. We did it. 1215. You guys okay? All right, here's the good news. After your class on uh, Wednesday or Thursday, we're on to animals. We'll actually start talking about animals on Wednesday in class. But that won't be on this exam. We got enough viruses, prokaryotes, protists, fungi, plants. You're going to be all right. Here's your study guide. Lecture video that up. Um, PowerPoint notes are available. If it's not in PowerPoint, you're not going to ask me about it. Unless it's a video with links to the PowerPoint, and then I'll tell you you need to watch this video. I'll make you a list of ones I want you to watch versus one that are going. I'll post that before Wednesday. Sometimes maybe it's even Wednesday morning, but between now and then. Good job, guys.